We need to talk about the new 16-team Big 12 and what some of the expectations for those teams are going to be over the next five years and who will win the most conference games because we can't depend on the non-conference because people schedule all sorts of people. And I actually hate that the dog-eat-dog nature of college football resulted in a standoff for survival between the Pac-12 and the Big 12 and the fact that the Pac-12 lost. And if you followed any of my content over the last couple of years, then you know that I saw the Pac-12's implosion coming from 50 miles away and was screaming from the mountaintops while everybody was like, oh, it's fine, they'll get it figured out. No, it wasn't happening. So the Big 12, despite losing its two biggest brands in Oklahoma and Texas, gets not only to survive, but to absorb the Pac-12's corner schools in the process. This conference, though, is actually harder to figure out because half of the schools are less than a year into their affiliation. So let's count it down from 16 to 1 with the Big 12 teams that are going to win the most games over the next five years. And we'll start with number 16, Cincinnati, because Scott Satterfield wasn't able to keep the ship afloat after Luke Fickle took Cincy to the college football playoff. Are there any signs that the Bearcats are going to bounce back this year? Because... Not going to be honest, if this 2024 transfer class of guys like Brandon Soresby, Joe Royer, and Evan Pryor don't seriously jumpstart this offense immediately, the Bearcats could get stuck circling the drain. Number 15, Baylor. If you're new to college football, this is going to shock you because Baylor having two losing seasons in a row under Dave Aranda is just an anomaly, right? Well, let me remind the uninitiated that Baylor was one of college football's worst programs prior to Art Browse's third year. They had 14 losing seasons in a row, and they can absolutely go back to that if they're not focused on being offensively innovative. They might be a year late on the coaching change that could have avoided a prolonged return into college football irrelevance, but we'll see if Toledo transfer quarterback Daquan Finn has enough juice in the tank to delay Baylor's decline. Number 14, Texas Tech. And now, here's a school with plenty of NIL money and a coach in Joey McGuire that can recruit better than anybody at Texas Tech has in a very long time. So, why am I short-selling Red Raider stock? It's the conundrum of two opposing factors. First, if Joey McGuire gives Lubbock their first nine-plus win season since 2008, he's going to be one of the hottest names on the coaching market. And second, if he turns in another mediocre season where both the offense and defense finish outside the top 60 while stockpiling more talent than Texas Tech has had in decades, the clock is going to start ticking on his time there in Lubbock. Either way, I don't see sustained success on the horizon. Number 13, Central Florida. UCF was a big fish in a small pond, and now they're trying to find their way in the Big 12. And so far, the results have been a mixed bag. Gus Malzahn can coach offense. My worry is on the other side of the ball. UCF was much better in the second half of 2023, and bringing in Ted Roof to help with the defense without blowing up the whole staff feels like a step in the right direction. Now, UCF is also recruiting at a level that would suggest Big 12 success is around the corner, but you have to wonder with any Florida school that isn't in the SEC or ACC, can they hold on to a kid that flashes talent or will they lose him to better NIL opportunities? Because maybe the Knights will prove me wrong here, but this feels like a team that will flirt with bowl eligibility year over year, but not be able to put it together. Number 12, BYU. Be careful what you wish for when it comes to major conference inclusion because BYU just has their first losing season since 2018 and their second since 04. And a big reason why is because they went 2-7 in conference. Taking a 32-point home loss to Iowa State in November is definitely a new development for Cougar fans. Head coach Kalani Satake has moved to looking to a portal solution at quarterback the last couple of years, and there have been plenty of BYU boosters that are willing to help keep the team relevant. But the portal also feels outside of the norm what BYU has been all about, about the development. Now, I don't think that BYU will ever be non-competitive, but I'm also not sure that they can rise to the top of the conference. Number 11, 
Texas Christian, a.k.a. TCU. The Horned Frogs are on the precipice of something special with their 2024 recruiting and transfer class, but this list is about sustained success. It's a ranking of how things will look in 2029, not just right now. And I'm not going to be shocked if they're fighting for a conference championship in 2025, but I'm also not going to be shocked if they're on the market for a new coach at the end of 2025. Because Sonny Dykes has two winning seasons in his six tries at Power 5 schools, and TCU had two seasons over 500 in the Big 12 in their last six tries. If the Horned Frogs rise to be a consistent Big 12 power with Dykes at the helm, it'll be a departure from the norm for both of them. Number 10, Houston. Houston had the same Big 12 root awakening that BYU did, but they decided that they were going to do something about it, and they traded in Dana Hogerson for a two lanes Willie Fritz. I like the move. And I think that this is where 63-year-old Fritz proves he can hang with the big boys. Now, I don't see him job hopping after a good season or two, but a lot of things will depend on how Fritz staff exploits the talent-rich area that they're in and the resources Houston has to get guys who left Houston for opportunities elsewhere out of high school to come home out of the portal. Number nine, West Virginia. Who would have thought that Neil Brown and his defensive coordinator, Jordan Leslie, would be riding the wave of optimism heading into 2024 after heading into 2023 under the guillotine? They had a top 50 recruiting class and transfer class, which doesn't usually happen for a coach that's on the hot seat. And with the short King Garrett Green returning at quarterback, you might actually be able to see back-to-back nine-win seasons for the Mountaineers. And if that happens, you might start to see the program recapture some of the consistency of its days in the Big East. Number eight, Iowa State. Iowa State has had six winning seasons in AIM since 2017, and Iowa State only had six winning seasons from 89 to 2016. So the question becomes, did Matt Campbell raise the floor for Iowa State, or is Iowa State and its history contributing to a low ceiling for Matt Campbell? Because this program still hasn't had a 10-win season since well, ever. And they did go 9-1 in 1906. So they have that going for them. Now, this is still a program that is bucking the trend of building through the portal and values talent development. And the bottom doesn't usually fall out for programs that are like that. And I think as long as Campbell is at Iowa State, six conference wins and a bowl game is within reach. Number seven, Colorado. Some people say, George, you don't believe Colorado could be higher than this if I didn't think the entirety of their potential success was tied to the presence of Deion Sanders. Now, they'll have the roster to be a factor in the Big 12 immediately, but again, this list is about five years from now. Without Deion, Colorado is a Mountain West-level sports school and not even the top of the Mountain West. Now, could Deion change that, though? Sure, but he's going to have to be at Colorado for a long time before people buy in like Nick Saban was at Alabama for 17 years. And I'd be impressed if Dion was at Colorado for seven, let alone 17. Number six, Arizona State. Now, Arizona State's recruits better than most Big 12 schools. They have inroads in Texas, and they're going to get talent from bounce back kids from California and Arizona in the portal every year. Talent won't be an issue, and Kenny Dillingham has said he wants to be there forever. So why don't I have Arizona State higher on this list? This is the NIL era, and Arizona State has to fight both tooth and nail to get the same boosters that they milked dry for a stadium upgrade and multiple coaching buyouts to come around to the idea of paying for a better roster. Now, this one is on the fans. If they want ASU to win, then they need to donate accordingly, and if they do, they'll win. If they don't, they won't. Number five, Kansas. Lance Leopold is becoming the new Matt Campbell. And every job that pops up has his name attached to it. And I'm starting to believe that the reason that he hasn't bolted is that he has an extremely clear vision of what the Jayhawks are building in Lawrence, Kansas. Now, the money is there. The football program has crazy energy around it. And some of the best pass rushing recruits that they've ever landed are severely underrated. And I think that Kansas has a similar issue to Colorado in that their success is tied to Leopold. But the difference is, I think that Kansas fans 
are actually Kansas fans. And they'll stick around if Leopold does leave and demand that the recent success becomes more of the standard. But I also acknowledge that I pointed out Baylor's history of losing. And so I have to point out that Kansas history makes Baylor look like Alabama. There's always a chance that the Jayhawks go back to being the worst major conference team in America, but I don't think that that will happen. There's an expectation now. They've grown accustomed. Number four, Kansas State. I have one concern about Kansas State, and it's a big one. I think that this team could challenge to be a college football playoff contender out of the Big 12 every single year. But to have consistently elite results, you have to consistently pull elite recruits. K-State doesn't do that. And I get that Bill Snyder was the ultimate chicken salad out of chicken shit head coach, but it's 2024 and Kansas Juco football isn't a secret anymore. And Chris Kleiman needs to be landing four-star kids like hometown boy Avery Johnson that he landed last year. If he does that, this conference might be for his taking. Number three, Oklahoma State. Every indication was that Oklahoma State was cooked heading into 2023. 18 kids transferred out. Derek Mason said, I'd rather take a year off than work in Stillwater anymore. And the first three weeks of the season looked like the Cowboys were the worst offense in America. Then guess what happened? They still went on to the Big 12 championship game. And I'm not counting out a Mike Gundy coach team anymore. It's pointless. Now, I don't care if they run out there with a Pop Warner roster. They haven't had a losing record since 2005. And as long as Gundy is there, they'll be able to compete to win the league. Number two, Arizona. Arizona is a Big 12 school in a Big 12 city that was stuck in the Pac-12. Now, Brent Brennan is a great hire out of San Jose State, and they're going to tap into the California talent pool more than any other school in the conference. And I genuinely think that this is the start of a special era for the Wildcats. And it's buoyed by the fact that they retain most of an extremely talented offense despite Jed Fish leaving for Washington. Now, Tucson might not have been the gym city of the previous conference, but for the Big Big 12 recruits, they can go to a city that is bigger than everyone except for Houston, but still has the feel of a college town like Lawrence or Morgantown. Plus their boosters? Oh, them boys are aggravated and they are mad as hell pouring resources into the program to help circumvent the school's financial issues. Now, number one. Utah. The Big 12 didn't want Utah, and Utah didn't want to be in the Big 12. They're a built-in villain, and trust me, they're more than comfortable playing that role. They develop talent better than anyone. They're physical, and they use the Pac-12 to make recruiting inroads in California. And now they're going to be playing road games in Texas? Pfft. Man, as long as Kyle Whittingham is in charge of the Utes, they're going to be the class of the Big 12. And I know that that's the last thing that Big 12 fans really want to hear.